Y'all know what it is, okay? <clears throat> so, let's get right down to business. This is, as you saw the title, the New Edition Story Part 1 Recap, okay? And I must freaking say that I don't know if BT got some new people over there. BT became a little bit type of woke and was like, bitch, we don't need a lot of foolishness on this TV channel no more. Uh, and, and start getting serious about putting some series up because BET is trying to give it to us in 2017. And I am all here for it, okay? BET got the New Edition Story three-part series that comes on tonight, that came on tonight, okay? That comes on Wednesday, that comes on Thursday. And then they have The Quad that's coming on next month and also this other show called Rebel. And I'm looking at the commercials like... I'm interested. I'm interested. I will be watching. I said, okay, BT, get yourself a clap for that because you didn't get my attention back again. Okay? You had it a little bit with being Mary J, but she being a little dumbass, so, you know, I'm going to still watch. But y'all got some new shit that's keeping me entertained right about now, and I'm loving it. And let me tell you something. If it's going to be like this, what they do... <sighs> BT budget then got big as fuck all of a sudden, okay? And they went all out for this new edition um, movie. And the promo been crazy. I remember hearing about it earlier last year. And then when we were seeing, you know, them practicing and doing all the stuff for it. And at one point in time, in the middle of the, uh, last year, probably like towards the summer or whatever. It was damn near promo everywhere. Like, you know, trailers and shit. And I'm like, damn, why do we have, when is the release date? When is the release date? Then come to find out it was in January. I said, ain't this about a bitch? We ready for this shit now. Okay, give it to us now. All right? But uh, it was worth the wait. It was worth the wait. I will say that. And like I said, it seems like the budget over there at BT didn't get big because they put time and effort into this mini series. All right? It's three parts. And this first part, if the first part is this damn good, just imagine what the next two parts going to be about when they really go into the depths of the rivalry and bullshit that went on with New Edition when they got older. Like, come on. I'm just sitting here like, the show, the, the, the first part pulled me in in the first five minutes because it starts off with um, the, older, the older cast members and... We see Bobby on stage. They was on tour in New Mexico, 1997. They was doing, I guess, a new edition slash um, Bell Biff DeVoe slash, you know, whoever Bobby Brown tour. You know what I'm saying? They was all going to have their little parts, Johnny, all them stuff. And I guess they was getting little segments, okay? But Bobby went over three hours. This motherfucker was performing on the stage for three damn hours. I said, first of fucking all, you got me fucked up. Okay, <laughs> you would have had me all the way fucked up. I am three goddamn hours. I could have took a nap, woke the fuck up, and went right back to sleep, and then did some other shit. You mean to tell me y'all sat back there for three hours and didn't do shit? Fuck you mean. We would have been boxing on that stage way before then. Get his ass off right fucking now. And then when they do all of that, <laughs> of course, Bell Bid the Vogue come out there, and they was like, fuck this shit. We finna get out here and, um... Wreck shop, you know, let's do our thing, okay? You say I'm nasty. I said, Bobby, get your ass off the stage. And if you watch, you see that moment right there. And if you watch the season, um, the, the, the rest of the show, when they were younger, you can see how they basically was building up and showing you how little Bobby was going to start acting the ass, okay? Because little Bobby was still doing shit, hip rolling and all that stuff. I said, excuse me, sir, you're like 12. You're like 10. Cool that down. You got to cool it down. Cool that shit down, okay? Who you fucking? All right? No, don't get these little kids. Don't get them little kids like that. I said Bobby going to be the bad one. Sure enough, that's how they made it seem like. But, um, you know, when they do shit like this, it's always a nigga in the group who got somebody on their team that's a Suge Knight-ass nigga, okay? That dude came out there and told Bobby, so you gonna let them do that to you? You gonna let them do that to you? I said, shut your ass up. Shut it up. Don't do that. Girl, next thing you know, he come out there with a fucking water hose. I said, who does this? Now, question. Did this shit, I know, this supposed to be based on their life and shit? And sometimes when they do these little biopics and all this stuff, they kind of embellish just a little bit. 
did that shit really happen? Who, you know, because I was young. I was young. When, when, let me tell you something. New edition is before my time, okay? No lie. They before my time. But I got into them when I was young, um, hmm, probably like a teenager. Um, in my adults, I was able to appreciate, you know, the goodness that they were. And looking at the backstories, especially when we get to the Maurice Stark girl, we'll get to that in a second. So, it's a lot of stuff that I didn't witness because I wasn't, you know, I was I was young. And I was born in 87. They was popping off in the early 80s, okay? I was born in the late 80s, all right? So, I didn't know shit about this stuff. But did that shit really happen? That's all I really want to know. I said, you pulled a water hose, my nigga? A water hose? And then they fighting in the back. And then somebody had to pull a gun. Niggas always pulling a goddamn gun. Y'all love living up to a goddamn stereotype. But anyway, we're not going to do that. After that scene, it goes into the introduction. You know, um, what, 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 what you call the intro, like I just said. You know, the credits and stuff at the beginning. And the pictures and the photos cinematography, the photography, all of that shit. I'm sitting here like, BET has been working. They said we will not fuck this shit up because we have to get this all the way to the likeness of this group. This is a iconic group, if you ask me, especially for us black folks. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, people rip them off, okay? We'll get to that in a second. And I was just like... They literally got the poses, the clothes, everything down to the T. And I'm saying, y'all are not missing one single detail. I'm like, look at this shit. That's what really got me hype. I said, oh, shit, they really finna do this. They not finna do this shit. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> but um, anyway, moving on from that, what else is going on that I really wanted to talk about? So... If you know the new edition story, they put in there, um, you had Lil Ralph. Lil Ralph, he was played by, uh, not Lil Ralph, Lil Ricky. He was played by, um, if you saw Stranger Things on Netflix, the black boy that was in the movie, in um, the TV, the series, that's Lil Ralph. Um, then we see him trying to go see Michael and we see his mama. His mama was not here for Michael. That motherfucker was a badass. He always smoking weed. No, you don't need to be around him. Mind you, his mama is played by, I can't remember her name. I just had it, but I left it. I just know she had, a, um, she had a, a episode of being on TV. And if you've seen that, she played in Ally McBeal. She played the, um, bitch that, uh, um, on Eve Bayou that the daddy was cheating on, that uh, she saw him fucking in the uh, fucking room. Yeah, huh. That's the mama to Michael, okay? And they go meet up, go to the talent show. They want to go to this talent show to see little Bobby performing on stage. Bobby freezes up. We hear, enjoy yourself, enjoy yourself, enjoy. I said, come on with them. Listen, it was Jackson's and the Jackson 5 songs just going throughout, okay? And I said, it makes sense. Because that's the group that they want to look up to, you know, another black boy band that's talented. So let's emulate them. My, uh, Bobby got up there, froze the fuck up. I said, look at Bobby. So you had a little stage fright. You know, he later says after they get into a fight over him, they walking in the projects. He got on these, I was confused about them pleather pants that he had on in the projects. First of all, it looked like he had a cup on. And I said, wait a minute, I'm confused about what's going on right here. Fix that. Fix that. But um, he just said he froze up with all them people start screaming and shit like that. So, you know, they do all that shit. And they just show you how they come together. Then, you know, they go see Ralph, okay? We go see Ralph. Ralph was supposed to be like this martial artist enthusiast or some shit. He's showing off for a girl named Xena. Um, we see, what's his name? Ricky go up there talking to her. Then he starts she singing to him, singing to her. And then all of a sudden, Ralph's bigger. No, this is my bitch. And starts singing. I said, all right, y'all got a little flavor. Come on, let's do it. So I got a question. Um, The, the little kids, when they're up here singing and stuff, are that them really singing? I'm pretty sure it's the one that uh plays Ricky. 
that's really singing. But all the other ones, because when they get into the actual group and then they pro they put Ralph as the lead singer, especially when they went to the studio and they were singing Candy Girl, was that really him singing? Because whoever the fuck it was, I mean, it sounded like the record, but then again, it didn't. But then again, it still sounded good. So I'm a little confused. Y'all let me know. All right. But, um, yeah, that wind up happening. And we see the condition where they come from. And, you know, we saw little Frida Gats up in there. Uh, she was playing. I can't remember whose sister he, she was playing. I think it was Ricky's. Ricky's sister, whatever the fuck. And the brother, he was just being an asshole and all that shit. Then they went and found Brooke Taylor, who I guess he um, manages a couple of groups, the Untouchables, some other people, whatever. And he said he didn't do kids, all right? He trying to get his dicks up. Truth be told, that's what it was because he was coming out of whatever he was coming out of with a girl. He was trying to get his dick up or whatever the same, you know. And they stood in front of his car and said, no, you, you are not leaving until you see us, all right? And they just start, you know, doing their thing. And he said, fuck it, you know, meet me at this place at the, um, you know, rehearsal hall or whatever at 9 o'clock. And that's how their relationship started. And he started getting them together, training them. And what I appreciate about music Back then, even from the Motown era, the level of dedication and the level of training that they put the artists through to make sure that they were on point, the discipline, okay? We don't see that these days. You see people get signed to a label and it's getting a booth, do what you got to do, and then they throw them right there. On. Her name is Lisa Carson. That's what it is. Ricky Mama. Um... You see them just get thrown on the stage and they doing any and everything. Uh, show don't be tight. Footworks be all messed up. But you see them going through the actual process of what they took to build up their endurance, build up their strength, you know. It was like the Matthew Knowles camp, okay? That's what it was. I would say Joe Jackson, but Joe Jackson, you know, Joe Jackson was a little bit of beef, okay? You ain't hear that shit from me, but you know, y'all know the deal. Um, But... He did give you that type of feel, though, because he was on them to keep going, try to get them perfected, perfected, perfected. And he was such a good manager that I love that one scene where they were practicing in the gym and his back was facing them. And he had his eyes closed and he can tell who was messing up on the steps without even looking at him. I said, ain't that some shit? See, he's paying attention. He know what he's doing. I said, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. And then they get up there, they doing these little talent shows and all this stuff. And next thing you know, um, we get introduced to, I think, Maurice Starr. They trying to um, do a talent show for him. Okay, Maurice Starr was the guy that signed them to a crooked-ass deal, if you ask me. He played them. He took advantage of them. And in these day and age, back then, I think it was just... You know, so easy because you got kids that are living in poverty, living on the projects, ain't never had nothing, and all of a sudden they want to make it out the hood so bad, the first person that sends them a goddamn recording contract, they sign on the dotted line. We'll get to that shit in a minute because I got something to say. I said, bitch, what? What? Okay. So when the talent show start off, first of all, Mr. Freeze come out there. Y'all know that was Jackie Long, right? I said, look at Jackie Long ass. I recognize that motherfucking nose any fucking well, all right? And then Faison Love is playing Maurice Starr. <sighs> now, I was here for everybody's character. You know, um, um, Bobby Brown Mama is played. Her name, Carol, okay? We know that. She played by, um, I can't remember her name either. Never knew her name, but what, 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 what she played in? She played on The Wire, okay? She played Naaman's mom, Weebay's baby mom, okay? And that bitch was a bitch then, and she was a bitch on here too, but she was a bitch for a different reason on here. And I respected her being all up in the business like that on here. Like, she was, you know, she was doing the most, but I was here for it. Um, Wood Harris, who plays Brooke, he... Play Avon Barksdale from The Wire, okay? And then, um, you know, you got Lala on here, who's going to eventually play Ronnie's mother, who is also Brooke's sister, okay? Her name is Flo in here, just in case y'all didn't know. Uh, and then Nicole, Yvette Nicole Brown plays Michael's mother. And then, who else? 
Ralph's mama is played by Ebony. I just came to dance. Monica Calhoun. Okay. <laughs> Y'all gonna get mad at me because I'm gonna keep on calling her. That is what her name is. Fuck Monica Calhoun, baby. Your name is Ebony. I just came to dance. Okay. I don't know what y'all. Mm -mm, I just came to dance. Y'all know where that come from. But I will say when they had Monica Calhoun come up there. I said, oh, my God, they got her looking like all type of struggles. Okay, I said, did you have it the worst? I mean, you living in the projects as it is, but it's like, damn, she got it the worst of all of them because she just looks so downtrodden, so tired and everything. And I just said, wow. And that scene where um, the kids uh, went out there and tried to, they put their money together, her two kids to buy a little Christmas tree or whatever with the money that they saved up and the way her heart broke because she felt like I should be able to want, be the one doing that and not them. I felt for her in that moment. I said, damn, that's crazy. And I was like, where they daddies at? Look at this shit. Look at this shit, bitch. The fuck? Anyway, um, back to the talent show. So the boys get up there. They sing and stop the love you say will be your own. You gotta take it slow. <laughs> that is my shit. Y'all know I'm a Jackson 5. Jackson's, Jackson enthusiast. I, I, I love the Jacksons. Let me tell you something. It is so good. Um, The crowd was into it. Everybody is into it. But they didn't win. This other hip hop group won. And so that the crowd was like, boo, no. So then that told Maurice Star to bring the other ki the, the kids back and they wind up winning a contract too. See, he saw something. He saw prey. Maurice was just like a fucking predator. He saw what he wanted and he went right after them. And he saw an easy target. He saw the desperation that these boys had and he took advantage of it. That's all that it was. And let's get on Maurice Star. Maurice Star was playing by Faison Love. I'm a big bitch, and from one big bitch to another, I will say he lost just a tad bit of weight because he used to be so goddamn big that it literally looked like he was going to pass the fuck out just from moving one face to the other. But my thing is, no. They had that thing on his head that I don't know what the fuck that was supposed to be, a skunk or some shit. Take it off. Don't do it. Dried up Jerry Curled ass wig. No, we're not here for that. And... It was just, it was just a lie. I said, um, I'm not here for that. Y'all saw when he was trying to reach for that phone and he could barely, them little T-Rex arms. Said, you can't be short and fat at the same time. You got to pick a struggle. Like, come on. You know, I, I'm glad I'm a fat bitch, but I'm tall. Okay. You can see my weight, but it's proportional. I'm just saying, you know, I'm working on it, y'all. I can talk about shit like that because it's real. It's real. But, um, it is what it is. So, Maurice, you know, they get into the studio, and this is when they start um, singing Candy Girl. And they was feeling like, the boys was feeling like, so damn, Ralph in the studio, when we gonna um, start singing? Is we gonna have a part? And at this point, moment in time, before they get to the studio, this is when Ronnie gro uh, joins the group because Maurice was like, you're trying to be like the Jackson 5. We need five boys, okay? You need to get somebody else. So, Ronnie was Brooke's cousin. I mean, Brooke's nephew, okay? And so, he joined the, Brooke, uh, the group. And did y'all see the scene when Roland, his little brother, was like, you can't sing and you ain't going to do this. Don't make me take off my belt. I said, so you the daddy of the house. All right, you know, baby haters. You know, you they birth them. I said, that baby was going to be a hater all his life. Anyway. Moving on from that. So, go back to when Brooke first met them. Brooke told them, there is no leader of this group. Everybody, it, there's no solo star. That's basically what he was saying. Everybody has to be in sync, you know? And as soon as they said that, it was almost so many, so many scenes that was like foreshadowing as to who was going to break off. Because in their very first performance, we see Lil Bobby doing a hip roll, getting all out of formation and stuff. I said, look at him. Look at them. Then they showing the tension that they having in the studio because they like, how come Ralph is all of over these songs and not us? And that goes on throughout the whole fucking episode, um, the rest of the thing. And Maurice, he's so sneaky and conniving, going to go over there to fucking Ralph and trying to convince him to go solo. Mind you, the song, they ain't even have a song out yet. It's not even a hit yet. And I'm like, damn, can you fucking wait? <laughs> can you wait? Give them a second shit. 
and you know, trying to, oh, he just said, he just felt like a predator and it just felt so disgusting the way that he was doing it because he was just like, yeah, you did this. You know, I grew up the same way. My mom used to make them grilled cheese. We were so poor, we couldn't even afford the cheese and the cheese was free. <laughs> but let me tell you something. You got that air factor. You should think about going solo. You know, leave them other ones behind. You're like the Michael other group. And I said, that's all you needed to say. Because everybody wanted to be Michael. Because everybody knew it was about Michael. Okay? They even said in thing. Y'all treating him like Michael and what? We supposed to be Tito and Jermaine and them? I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> At least you know your place. Let me stop playing with y'all. But, um... That's when we saw the scene with the Christmas tree and them, you know, they they set that up as if that was going to be the moment where they was going to fall in line and he was going to, you know, betray the group. But instead, he goes and called Maurice and was like, nah, I'm going to sign a contract and we're going to be together. You can take me and the boys or nobody, okay? Because I'm not going to turn. That's not what we do up in my hood. I said, that's what you do, Ralph. That's what you do because I would have fucked you up if you would have been a traitor like that. Don't betray them. Somebody else probably would have did it within a group in a second, Bobby. But, you know, you don't you don't compromise your character like that. But um, moving on from that, Maurice gives them a contract. And he's selling them hopes and dreams and all this shit. Baby, do you know that they said you had all the family, all the white, um, the mothers and shit there, and all they heard was, I'm going to give you $500 each plus the better max, which was a bike. I said, are you serious? They was like, oh my God. Yes, bitch, 500 I said $500. Now, let me tell you something. I know this is still the early 80s, but $500 really wasn't that much. I mean, it was some, but it wasn't that much. Like, come on, when you calculate a lot of stuff. $500, y'all got hyped over $500, motherfuckers quitting their jobs and shit. I said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Michael get to his feelings because what if I can't play basketball again? Girl, I mean, boys, fuck that. Fuck that, okay? Fuck all that. You finna go sing, all right? So they going on all this. Y'all know the story. They going perform here, perform there, and the mothers are worrying like, where is the money? Okay, Brooke, you are the manager. They at one point cornered Brooke in his apartment. Where is the money? He said, look, I'm the manager, but I don't deal with the money. The money comes from the booking agent and shit like that. And I said, well, damn, Maurice, how much money you getting paid as being the manager and all this other stuff? Because you still living in the projects, too. Okay, I, I, I was just a little bit confused. Like, how were you getting paid? I know he had other groups, but, you know, it is what it is. They out here in the Roseland and... You see on the marquee, new edition, Curtis Blow, Madonna. And Curtis Blow is in the back. Whoever they had playing Curtis Blow, burn it, okay? Don't do him like that. But Curtis Blow was in his feelings because he was like, so you the promoter got me up here opening up for new edition? These some little ass kids that just came on the scene. What the fuck you think I am? I'm a fucking legend. And, you know, it was a blow to his ego. And I understand that because they are kids and they just came on the scene. But at the time... They got a hit out, and hell, they number one. Michael Jackson number two. Like, okay, Madonna just got off stage. I said, they was before Madonna? That's major, bitch. So they get out there, and they do their thing. Mike out there <laughs> flirting with the girls. You know, you beautiful, right? Can I get your number? I said, wait a minute. Y'all all are but 12 years old, and y'all got 16, 17, 18-year-olds and up. Fine and, and just 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 screaming and falling out all over you. I said, look at that shit. So they do their little shit. And let me just tell you this. They got them steps. They got the music down pat. I'm sitting in here jamming like, yes, y'all better fucking do that shit. Okay. Um. Then all of a sudden. We still see them out on the road. We see them going through different states, different countries. And then by the time we get to London, UK, we see them morph, okay? Literally morph into teenagers. And it's the the grown-up ones that we see. I said, look at this. BET, y'all did that shit, right? So they on tour. And then they have to come back to the projects, okay? 
And they're in their feelings like, damn, we've been on tour and doing all this stuff. So now all these shows and we got to come back to the goddamn hood. I don't even want to do this, but, you know, it is what it is. And at this moment in time, this is when shit blows up. They get a fucking check that they were supposed to split five fucking ways of a dollar and 87 cents. Bitch. I was here like, Carol, the fuck is this shit? Carol was not playing it. Carol was not having it. Uh, we been on tour all this time and we only get a dollar. I quit my goddamn job. We supposed to split a dollar 87. Bitch, let me calculate that. A dollar 87. One dollar 87. Divided by motherfucking five. And you know they're going to take some taxes out of there. And that's 37 cents. We going to round that shit. That's 37 point. That's point three seven four cents. Bitch, how the fuck... 37 cents amongst all five of us. I can't even go get a piece of goddamn gum for that. Are you serious? That's what y'all... <sighs> Back in the day, it was so easy to take advantage of these artists because they were so eager. They didn't have lawyers. And they're fresh. They don't know what it is. And so that's what happened. That's what happened. Carol was pissed off. Flo was pissed off because Carol and them basically blaming Brooke, saying if you was a good manager, this wouldn't have happened. Of course, Flo was going to be in her feelings because Brooke is her um brother and all that shit. She tried to pull um, Ronnie out the group. He was like, no, no. Then they go get a new manager named Gary, played by Michael Rappaport. And he's selling them hopes and dreams like, I'm going to get y'all on this new label. What happened to y'all should never happen to y'all. I'm going to get y'all on a major label um, deal and get y'all playing on national TVs, on TV shows and all this stuff. And so they take them to MCA Records and they was like, who owns this? Who's the um, head of this? It was a black man. Girl, it was Tank. I said, you know, I've grown to appreciate Tank after this last album that he put out. That last album was... You know, something hot. I said, all right, Tank, you better do that. And, you know, they got to perform for him. And what I just didn't understand why every time they went somewhere, they just go on jumping on people's shit. And I'm just like, God damn, can y'all just be, act like y'all got some goddamn sense. And at first, Tank was looking like he was cool with it and they were singing. Then you see them in the boardroom and, you know, he like, what the fuck is this ghetto-ass shit? This is what I gave you a million dollars to sign. You know, this ghetto-ass uh, group. This is not who I wanted and all this stuff. And then we see uh, the boys fucking in a room together. Gary then found, like, these two bodyguard-like dudes that's going to be chaperoning them. All the They in there fucking with each other. I said, so y'all fucking bitches in the dark room. I just, I wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. I wouldn't be, I know niggas do that shit. But that's disgusting to me. You know, I just, I don't wheel it out. I don't want to see your ass. I don't want to hear your sex noise. I don't want to see all that. I don't want to do all that. But hey, it is what it is. Um, Later, they get into the studio. Ralph, once again, is singing the whole song. And he was giving me very much Michael Jackson, She's Out of My Life tease with the, the the polo shirt, being on the mic and all that shit. And they and they feelings like, so what, he gonna sit up here and sing everything? Fuck this shit, we finna go down to the mall or whatever and get some, um, get some girls or whatever. And that's basically what wound up happening. They did all that shit and left his ass. They literally iced his ass out. I said, damn... So, because Ralph got some um, lead vocals, and they put him as the lead singer, and we, they did this. Maurice started knew exactly what he was doing when he first started it, and we saw them do that little photo shoot of the um, Candy Girl cover art, okay? And when he was like, the photographer was like, who is the lead singer? And they was like, ain't no lead singer. And then Maurice was like... Ralph is the lead singer, you know. Let me tell you something. They got that with down to the T2, even down to the sneakers. I said, damn, they fucking did that shit. BET, y'all did that shit. And let me tell you something. Maurice Starr, he straight played them, took their whole style, took everything that he did with them. New kids on the blocks. A white version that went way bigger. Mm-hmm. He knew what the fuck he was doing. He won shit, so let's fuck him for life. Anyway, moving on from that. That was uh, BT's part one from New Edition, um, the New Edition story. I loved it. I'm hooked. I can't wait till tomorrow. 
and you guys tell me what you feel about it. Tell me did you like it, what you didn't like, all that stuff. Do you think that everybody is doing a good job acting, true to the characters? Tell me. Let's discuss, all right? I'll see y'all tomorrow. Peace. One more thing. I just love the fact that we all coming together watching this shit is so hype because it reminds me of when the Jackson 5 or the Jacksons and American Dream miniseries came on when I was real young and me and the family, we was all around the TV just watching it. So that's what we doing. It's so fucking good. Y'all tell me how y'all feel. I'll see y'all later for real.